What's up guys, welcome to River Park. Thanks for joining our online experience today. You're watching our most recent live experience. If you wanna catch us the next time we're live, we're live every single Sunday at 9 a.m. You can join us here online or you can check it, our experience out at one of our campuses. We wanna to get to know you, so if you're not yet connected, you can either click the Get Connected link or text the word River Park to 97 Zero, zero, zero. We hope this experience blesses you today and hope to see you soon.
morning to be desperate. Come on, let's ask him, invite him into this place. We say, come now, Jesus. Sure. 
want you guys to think about, because I feel like this season, I feel like a lot of you guys are carrying so much on your shoulders that you were never intended to carry. So guys, I want you to think of whatever that thing is going on in your life right now that you are just weighing you down. It's exhausting. I'm telling you guys to put your focus on Jesus and you're gonna lay down that thing that you've been carrying that you were never intended to carry. Oh, lay it down.
so well. Hey, can you give the worship team a great big hand this morning? Thank you guys for leading us in worship today. Y'all, who's excited to be at the park this morning? Anybody? It is great to be here in the AC today. Thank you, Lord, for very large AC units at the end of the summer. Uh, it's a great weekend, a great Sunday morning here at River Park, and we're honored and delighted to see all of you here. To our River Park fam, as always, it's great to see you guys back uh, both in the building and online. And if you're new today, we want to welcome you right now. Welcome to the park. We're honored to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I serve as one of the pastors here. And on behalf of all of our team, we want to welcome you guys to River Park. We hope that you're blessed by being with us, but most importantly, by being with Jesus today. So River Park family, right now, I want you to help me welcome our guests. Come on, let them hear you this morning. Give them a warm welcome. We love you guests. And to all of our online fam, we never forget about you guys that are tuning in from all over North Louisiana and all around the country and the world, our online audience. We love you this morning. Thank you for being with us. We pray that you are blessed by your time here as well. Guys, it's been an awesome week uh, here at River Park. There's a lot going on that Pastor Marcus is going to share some cool stories about with you later. Uh, but we want to let you know about a awesome Sunday coming up just a couple of weeks from now. Y'all, it's almost Labor Day. I don't know if you can believe that or not. All the sweater people are like, yes! <laughs> Uh, we're going to have to quit wearing white and start wearing wool in just a couple of weeks. 
Uh, but in conjunction with Labor Day weekend, we like to do this on holiday weekends because it's easy for families to come out and participate. So on Labor Day weekend, September 5th, we are going to be doing child dedications that Sunday, guys. It's a beautiful time. We dedicate our little ones to the Lord and set them on their way in a life pointed at Jesus and his purpose for their life. So uh, we want to invite you out to be part of that. Uh, invite your family to come if you have babies or even older children that have never been dedicated to the Lord. Uh, we want to invite you to be part of this. You can sign up and register on the website or the River Park app. Uh, super easy. And we look forward to that. It's going to be an awesome celebration of our little ones, y'all. Stand up on your feet all around the room, if you would. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, we're about to worship some more. We're about to move into a time of giving, guys. We do this every Sunday. And the reason that we do is because it is an opportunity to worship Jesus uh, with our hands, with our pocketbooks, and not just with our lips. Uh, we do this, we worship Jesus through giving because we love him, not just to be blessed, not out of obligation or guilt or anything like that, but because he has been so very good to us. Has Jesus been good to any of you guys this week? <laughs> that is what I'm talking about, especially on the front row here. Well, we want to give back to him today. And so we invite you into this time and space. Uh, if you'd like to participate in this with us today, the ways that you can do so are on the screen behind me here. And as you prepare to give this morning, let me pray a blessing over you. Father, thank you so much for your presence that's here. Holy Spirit, we sense you in the room and we thank you for coming to be with us today. Jesus, we thank you for your finished work, uh, for all that you've done, for all that's still playing out and, and taking place by our perspective, but we know that you have finished it, Jesus, and that you've blessed us and you have loved us and you have moved mightily this week on our behalf. And so we give you thanks today. Uh, we give offerings to you, not out of guilt, not out of obligation, but because we love you, Lord. And I just pray that you receive those this morning, that you use them for good, that you use them to bring your kingdom in Shreveport and in Bossier as it is in heaven. And Lord, we just pray blessing and peace over every person who gives today. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. River Park, can you say amen? God bless you guys as you give this morning. Meet somebody that you haven't met. Be friendly. Uh, fist bump. High five. Pastor Marcus is headed your way with part two surrounded. It is going to be an awesome morning. Thanks for being here, guys. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the park, everybody. So glad that you're here today. Turn to your neighbor and say, you look pretty good. Turn to somebody else and say, you look even better. I hope that one's your wife. Otherwise, you're in trouble right now. You may have to rearrange that later, all right? Hey, welcome to the park. My name is Marcus. I want you to do me a favor. Welcome all of our guests and our online people right now. 
Welcome, Park. To those of you guys watching online, thanks for being here. If you ever come here in person, wear clothes. We would love for you to wear clothes instead of the way that you're watching online right now. It's like, we can't see you. We just know that's what's going on. I'm just saying. Hey, we are so glad you're here. I do want to talk about something that happened yesterday. Last series we did here was a series called Servolutionary, and we talked about like uncommon service. We talked about how serving can impact our lives, how it's worship to God, how it helps me grow as discipleship for me, but it's also a way that we can actually, we can do uncommon service to others, and it, it points people to Jesus. So yesterday we had this really cool serve event where we painted some carousel, some of the parts of the carousel that we are going to have putting right out here. For those of you that don't know, we bought a carousel that's going right out there, outside there, to really just really bring down, and these guys did some uncommon service. We called it Carousel Paint Day. It should have been called Electrician Day because those light sockets took forever to take off. If you see somebody today and you shake their hand and they have no grip, they worked on the carousel, okay? Just that's what it is. That's what it is. But I want you to do me a favor. Give a big hand for all those awesome volunteers that did that. It was a whole lot of fun yesterday. I saw Jeremy up there just a second ago. All focused. Get it right. All right. If you think, hey, man, I missed it. I wish I hadn't have missed it. No worries. There's going to be tons of more painting coming up. In fact, starting on Tuesday, there will be a sign-up on our website. You can go and register to come paint with friends at any point in time you want to. Just let us know when you're coming. We have it set up in the barn. You'll let us know when you're going to be here. We'll make sure it's unlocked for you, and the paint will be set out, and you can paint it. Now, you must paint it the way we want it painted. Just saying, okay? You don't get to paint whatever you want. But, but if you want to do that, you're welcome to do that. You can sign up on our website. Are you guys all right this morning? All right. I had, I've had the world's longest week We've been working on our kids' building. We've been working on this carousel. My parents decided they wanted to move. My dad wanted to break his back before they moved. So that means I do everything. That's what that means. So I've had like the world's longest week. I mean, like it's been crazy. It's been a crazy week. And in spite of all that, I believe that God has given me a word for you today that I think we can, it can be very practical in its application. I want you to just take this back and be able to use it in your life. Is that all right? We started a series last week called Surrounded, how we feel like we can be caved in on so many times. Anybody ever felt surrounded? We talked about how many times in our current state, it is hard not to feel completely surrounded. You feel surrounded by sorrow. You may feel surrounded by grief. I feel like every day I'm getting a text message, hey, did you know so-and-so died? I feel like every day I get a new message like that. It's interesting to think, and somebody did this, made this observation that in our current world, used to, you weren't that connected. So you could shoulder the weight of what you heard because all you heard about was your family and some close friends who were going through stuff. So it was one or two at most. But today, you hear about things that are going on across the world in Afghanistan. You hear about things that are going on all the way in another state. Somebody that's a cousin to the person that you know. And you're carrying that weight too. So you realize now it's like it's not that you've gotten worse at carrying things. It's you're carrying more now in today's world than you've ever carried in your life because you are globally connected, globally connected. It feels like we're surrounded. My kids have this thing that they do. Your kids probably do too, and you might do it as well, where we tend to feel, we intend to interpret our entire lives by our present predicament. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Like, I don't know if you've ever done this. Maybe you're watching online and you do this, but like the current reality is the way that I interpret my entire life. Let me tell you how it goes for my kids, okay? They've had the greatest day of all time. We may have gone and done Splash Kingdom or something like that. It was the greatest day. But because they didn't get the food they wanted at the end of the day, it was the worst day ever. <laughs> and I mean like they're whining, they're crying. They're like, this is awful. You're a horrible dad. <laughs> like, you're never going out again in your life. You're grounded forever. Do you get what I'm saying, though? They interpret their entire day, entire life, entire being by their current surroundings. Could you be doing the same thing? I've, I've caught myself when something goes wrong. Come on. Why me? 
And then I look around, take a step back, and be like, man, I've really had it pretty good. Like, <laughs> this really hadn't been that bad. If this is the worst it gets, this isn't that. Y'all see what I'm saying? Like, sometimes we interpret everything around us by our current surroundings. But if you take a step back and look at your whole life, you may go, yeah, there are people that have it way worse than I do. But we tend to interpret it based on the current surroundings. And if we're careful, we will roll into this mode of being very depressed, very feel surrounded by things that we can't control because we're interpreting it by what is currently happening instead of the total picture, instead of what God wants us to see. And that's why we talked about this last week. Last week God's first priority is your sight, not your surroundings. He wants to fix the way you see the world, not just what's going on with your world. He wants to fix the way that you see it. We talked this story of Elisha last week and his servant. And Elisha was interpreting what God's word was saying and actually foiling the plans of the king of Aram. And the king of Aram wanted Elisha dead. If you want more on the story, you can go back and listen to last week's podcast. It was awesome. But I want you to hear this. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible because uh, this is it's a fantastic. I love that because I'm bragging on my own sermon. Um, it was awesome. <laughs> Here's the thing, here's the thing. When nobody else does it, you just help yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just help yourself, all right? Like, here's the thing that was so funny. <laughs> the thing that was so funny about what Elisha did is Elisha, the king of Aram, makes plans for about capturing the guy who is knowing what the king of Aram is saying. Makes no sense. So the king of Aram sends his troops to get one guy, surrounds an entire city to capture this one guy, Elisha so that they can get him and take him back. And I don't know if they're going to torture him or what, but they're going to get him. They're going to get rid of him. They surround him, and when this moment happens, Elisha's servant comes out, sees the whole army, and freaks out. He is scared to death because they are surrounded by an entire army. And in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16, this is what Elisha says to his servant. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. Then Elisha prayed. Everybody say he prayed. I love that. That's what you do when you feel surrounded, all right? You talk to the one that can surround the enemy, all right? Oh, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. I love this because Elisha didn't pray like you and I normally pray. Lord, remove the problem. Come on, that's what we pray, right? A, a circumstance comes up, it surrounds us, and we're like, be done with it, Lord. <laughs> be thou gone. King James version of prayer right there, right? Like, be thou removed from hence place now. Like, and, but that's not what Elisha prayed. What Elisha prayed was God open his eyes. And if you continue to read the story, after his eyes were open, then God went to work on the surroundings. But it took clarity of sight before he ever began to work on the surroundings. Sometimes we get the priority backwards. We think God should be working on our surroundings before he fixes our sight. But what God first wants to fix is your sight before he starts to work on your surroundings. He wants to fix that sight first. But I often thought that if God's wanting to fix my sight first, wouldn't it be nice if we had a way to be, always be able to tell the truth? Like not speak the truth, but like you could tell if someone was telling you the truth. Like, I always thought it'd be cool if you had, like, you know the Google glasses? Does anybody have a car that has, like, a heads-up display? Like, in the dash, there was this thing that came out, and it's been, technology has been around forever, but they don't really use it anymore because it was very awful. But, like, it's back now, yeah. But, like, heads-up display would be, like, all your readings that are on your dash would actually project on the windshield in front of you. So you actually look through the glass, but you're seeing the speed you're going. It's called a heads-up display, and it's right in front of you. You look through the speedometer at the out outer world, but you see it that way. Heads-up display. I always thought it'd be cool if we would invent some glasses <laughs> that had a heads-up display. And like whenever you met someone, somebody else's glasses had already identified this person as a liar. And so now when you're talking to them, it's just like, heads-up, this guy's lying. You know what I'm saying? Like, don't listen to a word he's saying. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I mean, it'd be really cool also for names. Like, it just pop up above there. This is John. Hey, John, how do you know my name? You know, like, it'd be really nice. 
But to be able to tell the truth is a powerful, powerful thing. I saw this news meme the other day. I thought this was great. It says, the news used to tell you that something happened. Then you had to decide what you thought about it. Now the news tells you how to think about something, and you have to decide if it actually happens. Right? It's crazy. That's crazy, and it's the truth, and it doesn't matter what slant you go from, whether it's right wing, left wing, middle wing, no wing. It doesn't matter. It's always doing it. It's interpreting it from an angle. Wouldn't it be cool if you could tell if somebody was telling you the truth or not? I even heard somebody say, one day we were talking to somebody, and he said, what would you pay for a news that would actually just tell you the truth? And I was like, well, no matter what you do, it's going to be slanted. You realize that every single person in this room has an opinion? Every single one. All of us have opinions. Opinions are like eyebrows. Everybody's got them and some of them are ugly. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Like, like, here's the thing. And those of you that don't have eyebrows, I'm sorry. I did not mean it to offend you, all right? Like, here's the thing. It's like everybody's got an opinion. And what we found out is we, what we're trying to do is determine whether or not this opinion that is being slanted at us is truth or not so that we can determine whether or not we're going to do something with this. But it's a very big challenge in our culture today. NBC released a, an article here not too long ago about these studies that these scientists did at a few colleges about how you could tell whether or not someone was lying. They found out that 60% of people cannot go more than 10 minutes without lying. 60%, 60%, more than half of this room, they would say could not go more than 10 minutes without lying. Now, here's the reason they could say that. You don't even realize you're lying. We've gotten so accustomed to it. When your wife says, does this look good? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. It always looks, you see what I'm saying? You don't even realize when your boss says, what do you think? It's great. Promotion. (laughs) You see what I'm saying? Like, we don't even realize we're lying. And they found out in this study that there are little things that are happening. When you say to your kids, I'll be there in three minutes. And you're five minutes later there. You're lying. We don't even realize. We've gotten so accustomed to not telling the truth that we don't even realize. Because most of us gasp when we said 60% of people can't go 10 minutes. We're like, how can that be? but we don't even realize that we're doing it in little situations like this. In fact, let me just show of hands. How many of you believe that you have this like extra sense you can tell when someone is lying? Anybody believe that? Anybody in the room? A few people. How many of y'all believe that those people are liars? Okay. You should have raised your hand the first time then. Okay. I'm just saying, all right, like here's the, (laughs) here's the thing. Here's the thing that you need to understand. They did, this, they did this study in the same article, in the same study, these doctors found out that here is the percent chance that you have of finding out whether or not someone is lying. You have a 53% chance at best of knowing whether or not someone's lying. Flip a coin. Flip a coin and find out whether or not they're telling you the truth. That's as good as it gets. That's as good as it gets. So if you think, and they used to say, well, if somebody looks to the left, they're trying to imagine it. If they look to the right, they're trying to recall what happened. I think that's great unless you're sitting on the right and they're looking at you and they're trying to imagine. You know what I'm saying? Like it could be that way. Like there's all kinds of things that mess with this, but there's so much noise that are going, that's going on around us that we don't know what is the truth. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise. Here's what the old school days in the, in the, in the, in, especially during World War II, the Germans controlled the media. And they had this word that was used, and I don't know when the word came about. It's probably long before this, but they made it popular. Propaganda. And the idea was that we we're going to give a slanted information overload. No matter what the truth is, we're going to feed this into people so that way they will believe what we say and then be discouraged, or if they're our troops, even if we're losing the war, they're going to be encouraged. And it was a deal, it was a ploy by the Germans to actually try and control the media, and they controlled all fronts of it. And as a result, in many cases, controlled a lot of the war in World War II. It was propaganda. It was noise. Now, if I were the enemy today, in today's culture, I would not do a frontal assault on God (laughs) or his people. How would I attack I would attack with lies so clever, as 2 Corinthians talk about, lies so clever that they appear to be the truth. 
That's what 2 Corinthians says. So I would attack with that. I would attack with this. It's noise that is all around us. I would make the people think this is a truth and begin to invest their life in it, but it's not a truth. It's so clever. It seems like a truth. Have you ever thought about this, like no, the way noise works and the way that all the things around us are, 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 are moving everything? You notice people turn their head towards noise? Like if somebody walks through that back door right now, Everybody look, even many people looked, even though I was just pointing to, but like if the door makes a noise, people are like, Freddy Krueger? No, it's perfect. It's a human. All right. You see what I'm saying? It's almost like we automatically look to where the noise is. If I were the enemy, this is exactly how I would strategize to get us distracted from where we're supposed to be looking. Look toward the noise. But you and I are called to be different. I want you to hear this. We are called to be, the word uses a, a unique word here. The Bible uses a unique word here that I think we, we misunderstand and we misconstrue it a lot. And this, we are called to be holy. Let me tell you an easy way to understand that. That does not mean you need to start wearing robes and a cross around your neck and stuff like that, okay? What it means is this, set apart. You are different. You look different. You act different. You are different different. This is what he calls us to be. John 17, verse 15. This is what the word of God says about this. This is Jesus speaking. He's praying and he says, Father, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world. I'm not asking you to change your surroundings. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world. They're different any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Everybody say truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. So what God is saying, the difference between you and everyone else in the rest of the world as a follower of Jesus is you should be able to tell the difference between what is a lie and what is truth. And then God, Jesus in his word actually delivers how we are to do it. Do you know how it is? We are to know truth through the word of God. Interesting thing here that's going on here. I love what Jesus is doing. He's kind of playing two sides of this because in John 1, 1, it describes Jesus as the word of God. So when he's praying this, he's like, hey, hey let them lean on the word. And he said, let them lean on me. It's a neat little prayer that Jesus is praying over his disciples. He's saying, hey guys, teach them your word so that they may know truth. That may know truth. Here's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, set your eyes on truth and not toward the noise around you. Not toward the noise around you. I've been in the woods many, many times and gone hunting with my, my dad or my grandpa or people like that. I've gone with many other people and stuff. When I was a kid, every little noise makes you turn your head, especially the darker it gets. My dad has a philosophy that if you're ever walking through a dark place and you look over your shoulder, the third time you look, you will run. It doesn't matter if there's anything there or not. The third time you look, you're going to run. Like, it's going to happen. Like, it's going to happen. Here's the thing I, I, I see in this. Noise causes us to move our eyes. Isn't that interesting? That what enters our ears affects our eyesight. Isn't that interesting that whenever we hear something, we have to engage it? In fact, my wife is always on me about this. You're not looking at me right now, so I'm going to stop talking. Because she knows if I'm not engaged with my eyes, my ears probably aren't engaged. So what we, what we hear is going to often affect what's going on. Here's the thing. We're surrounded by so much noise that our eyes are distracted from the truth. There's so much noise around us. I, I coach, I've talked many times, I, I coach kids soccer, which means I have to try and put up with a lot of parents. <laughs> That's what that means. Look, it's fantastic. The kids are running everywhere. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. I'm the coach. I'm trying to give them clear instruction on what to do next. And I've got parents, and I caught myself one day, I'm yelling across the field at a kid to pass the ball. He's nowhere near the goal. He cannot shoot. The only option he's got, he's surrounded. The only option he has is to pass the ball. I'm yelling, pass, pass. I'm yelling it as loud as I can, pass, pass, pass. And I listen just for a second, kind of take, I have kind of like this out-of-body experience. And his mom and dad are yelling, shoot, shoot. 
shut up. <laughs> and I realize what's going on here. The kid has no clue what to do. He's got so many, so many people speaking into his ears. Coach is saying, pass. Dad, who I live with and is going to punish me forever if I don't listen to him, is saying, shoot, what do I do? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm the coach. What you need to realize is that God has given you a coach. It is him. Jesus is our coach. He is instructing you on what to do. But if there is a whole lot of noise that surrounds it, you might not even hear his voice. You might not even hear what's going on. You might not hear what he's saying in that moment. He's saying, you should see it this way. But the world is saying, no, see it this way with the propaganda and the noise that is coming out. But he has a different way you should be looking, a different way you should see the world. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus does what he did so many times throughout Scripture. I don't know if you've ever kind of taken a look at it, but Jesus he'll blind people a lot. <laughs> Like a lot. Like, yeah, he would be an optometrist or an ophthalmologist today. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like Jesus healed blind people all the time. And in Mark chapter 8, he's going to heal this blind guy. These guys bring up their friend who's blind, and they say, can you do something with our friend? He needs to be healed. He needs his eyes open. And Jesus begins his work right here in Mark chapter 8, verse 23. It says, Jesus took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the village. This is interesting. I want to show you what Jesus is doing here. He's leading him away from the noise. To where the only voice that he could hear is Jesus's. He's not going to be distracted by all the other noise that is around him. Out of the village. Then, I love this. This is before COVID protocols. Spitting on the man's eyes. <laughs> he laid his hands on him and asked, can you see anything now? And I just pictured the guy, oh, I can see that you're rude. <laughs> back off bro <laughs> like you just spit on me like calm down like that's close right there man verse 24 the man looked around yes he said i see people but i can't see them very clearly they look like trees walking around okay this is a problem all right if you can't tell the difference between a man and a tree we got problems, all right? Like, we got some serious issues going on here. Verse 25, then Jesus placed his hands on the man's eyes again. Everybody say again. Now, did Jesus mess up? He had to touch the guy twice for him to be healed completely. This is interesting. And it says, and his eyes were open this time. His sight was completely restored, and he could see everything. Everybody say everything, everything clearly. Listen, I'm going to go back to the question that somebody asked me, what would you pay for a news to report to you everything is truthful? Let me tell you, what would you give for somebody to touch your eyes in such a way that you could see everything clearly? I'm not just talking about physically. I'm talking about what's going on behind this. I see it clearly. What if you could see everything clearly? That's what Jesus did this next time. Now, I want to break this down. I want to show you some different things. I needed you to get the context before I kind of dive into this a little bit. But I want you to understand some things. The first thing Jesus did was lead him away from all the noise. If you're in the village and Jesus is about to do something, he doesn't want you to be distracted by all the noise. This guy only uses his ears to communicate, only uses his ears to know what's going on around him. He's more heightened with his sound than you and I ever could be because we can see. So every distraction, every noise in, in our culture today because of all the noise that is around us, our ears are just like this man's. We hear every single thing. We're heightened to a new awareness of everything that goes on overseas, to everything that's in our backyard, to people that we don't even know. We're aware of all the stuff. Our ears are heightened. So the first thing that Jesus did is say, we got to get away from that. Come over here. Now, now, you hear my voice? Let me spit on your eyes. <laughs> he led him away from that. Here's the thing. We often fall prey to false truths because of their availability. Sometimes you'll believe a lie just because it's the most convenient thing to grab hold of. Let me, let me share it to you this way. If you watch three hours of the news every single day, you will begin to believe it because of its availability. 
I, I think it's funny that we have this, this moment where we want to do something. We want to, we want to know God. We want to connect with God, but we spend most of our time with noise, with noise. Maybe it's not the news for you. Maybe it's social media. It's the news now. <laughs> if it's got an opinion, it's got a slant. It's propaganda. And if it's got a human behind you, behind it, I promise it's propaganda. You and I can't help it. We ha I have propaganda. You know what my propaganda is? Jesus. I want everybody to go to Jesus. I have a slanted way of seeing the world and reporting the world. You don't have a choice. You're going to slant one way or the other. What I'm trying to tell you today, that is the noise around you is actually dictating how you do it. And what we don't realize is sometimes we contribute to the noise around us. Do you remember the, the shushers in class? I always thought that was stupid. Maybe you're a shusher. I'm not trying to get on you. I'm not trying to be mean, all right? But like, I always thought that was stupid because they contribute to the problem. Like, so you got people talking over here and they're like, shh. <laughs> I spit on the man's eyes. Um, it's like they're going all out to make noise to make you stop making noise. It makes no sense. It makes zero sense. You and I as believers and followers of Jesus often contribute to the problem instead of pointing to truth, instead of pointing to God. And we grab hold of the first available thing. Let me just talk to you about what you consume for just a second because God wants you to see truth, not the noise. Chelsea and I, we love watching shows together. We'll pick a show, we'll watch, we ask people what's a good show to watch, and we'll watch through a show, things like that. There have been shows that we've had to stop watching because the noise that came from them caused us to see our marriage differently, see our family differently, see sex differently. Come on, I'm, I'm speaking where you're at. That's noise. It's noise, and sometimes we're not willing to turn down the volume of the noise. Now, you fill in the blank what that is for you. I'm not going to start naming shows. That's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job, all right? But what I want you to do is I want you to recognize that's noise. That's noise. And we've had to make decisions and say, you know what? It may, for us, this is actually not going to work. We can't do this. This is, not, this is damaging. This is noise. So the first thing that Jesus did was lead him away from the noise because God wants to move you from the noise and closer to his word. The next thing that Jesus did is he, he spit on his eyes and healed his sight. He healed his sight. And then he asked a question. I love that Jesus asked this question. He said this. He said, can you see now? <laughs> you know Jesus knew the answer, right? He didn't ask it trying to get information. He knew the answer, but he asked the question, can you see? Can you see? And the man said, I can see men. They look like trees. Then Jesus went on to do something else. But this is something that's interesting. What do we normally do in prayer? We bring our questions to Jesus, right? God, I don't know why you do this. God, I don't like the way this happened. God, I don't like the way this worked out. God, why? God, why this? We bring our questions to the one who calls himself the answer. And let me just tell you, he's not afraid of your questions. If, and I love what one of the pastors that I've listened to a lot says. He's not afraid of your questions if you're not afraid of his silence sometimes. But I wonder if we've gotten it backwards in our belief system somehow. How we've actually brought our questions to God. But what if we would learn to submit our lives to his questions? What if instead of actually just bringing a question for him to answer, what if we actually took our lives to him and said, now what question do you want to ask me? I had to do an interview the other day with a, a guy that's working on his dissertation, and he asked me these questions about being a globally connected church and all this stuff like that. And he said, at the end of the interview, he asked a really cool question. He said this, he said, hey, and what is something that actually you, we should have asked in this situation? What's something we should have asked? What's a question that we should have asked in this interview? I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Because what he's saying is, hey, I know we interviewed you, but I want to know what we should have asked. Maybe that's the way we should approach God in prayer sometimes. Hey, God, what should I have asked? What should I be asking you right now? You're the answer, so you don't even know the best question that should be popping up in this moment. What should I ask? 
The last thing that Jesus did, and as I wrap up, I want you to recognize this. This is so powerful. The last thing that Jesus did was change his perspective. He healed his sight. He could see men as trees. He could see people walking around as trees. I love what Jesus did next. He didn't correct the surroundings. The man says, Jesus says, can you see? And the guy says, yes, I see men as trees walking around. And Jesus turned to the crowd and said, stop acting like trees. <laughs> Wrong, right? No, but that's what we want, right? We want, man, the world is jacked up. Stop being jacked up, right? You guys got it all wrong. But no, what did Jesus do? He corrected his perspective. He didn't just do this. He said he didn't just heal his sight to see it incorrectly. He healed his sight so that he could see the right way. Here's the thing that I, I realized when I was looking at this, that him seeing clearly and becoming his perspective being healed and seeing clearly what was going on around him was not him finally recognizing truth. You may tell you what it was. Here's what it was. It was the result of truth confronting him. It was the result of truth. Let me break it down so that, so that some of you can make sure that you get this because this is so powerful. We often are looking for truth behind the questions that are out there. Was that news report right? Is this slanted? What should I feel about this social injustice? How am I supposed to address these politics that I have no clue what's going on? How am I supposed to do this? Should I view this this way? Should I view it this way? What am I supposed to do? And we have this thing. Here's the thing. You're not gonna, if you think you're gonna find the truth in that thing, you're not. It's gonna be the result of you encountering truth. Truth is a person, his name is Jesus, and he wants to heal your sight, not conform to your perspective. But what do we do? We wanna bring our perspective to God and say, God, can, I de can you deal with this? God, can you deal with what's going on in me right now? God, can you, I'm bringing my perspective. Can you get with that? I see men as trees. Is that cool? I'm walking away now. Are you getting that? I see what's going on in the world. I think I see it clearly. Men are stupid. They look like trees. And we walk away from God going, I'm healed. I'm healed. Well, you're going to run over a bunch of men trying to cut down trees. You know what I'm saying? Like, and we end up doing more damage because we thought that was the truth. But when we subject ourselves to his truth, his word is truth is what the Bible says. When we subject ourselves to his, when we subject our opinion to his, here's the question I have for you today. Are you willing? Are you willing to submit your perspective to his truth? Are you willing to take what you think is going on around the world? Are you willing to submit your politics to his truth? Are you willing to submit your answers to his truth? Are you even willing to submit your questions to his truth? Here the other day, I had, uh, we were, I was hanging out somewhere. I forget where we were. I think it was at my in-laws. Yeah. And uh, I looked at my weather app. And I thought, this is jacked up. This is what popped up at the top of my screen on my tile. Shreveport, 36 degrees, excessive heat warning. <laughs> I was like, what just happened? I'm like, this makes zero sense. I start telling everybody. I'm like, look at this. This is so dumb. I can't believe that in Shreveport, the weather app is jacked. Pull your weather app up. Is it? No, yours is right. Why is mine messed up? And while I'm telling somebody, it doesn't. I'm like, oh, okay, bye. <laughs> and walk away because I don't want them to realize how much of a moron I am. I had it on Celsius by accident. I'm making fun of the way the truth is being delivered in this moment. I'm like, this is horrible. This is ridiculous. Can you believe the weather app gave it this way? Can you believe this? I'm like pointing fingers. I'm having fun at their expense, all that stuff like that, only to realize in a moment of doing this, I'm the moron. It's me. 
Come on, somebody, listen. Are you, are you willing to take what you think about the world around you and submit it to the truth of Jesus? Let me read you the scripture again. It's so powerful. Different translation. We started with it today. John 17, 17. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Make them holy. By the truth, in the truth, your word is truth. How do we set our eyes towards truth and not the noise around us? You surround the noise with truth. You surround the noise with truth and the truth will be revealed even in the midst of the noise. You surround the noise with truth. So here's my challenge for you today that I want you to practically walk out this week and it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be difficult. Some of you may do this practice. I started trying it because I never like to ask you to do something that I haven't tried. And I started doing it. I'm going to ask you to do it. I've been doing it for about two weeks now. And it'll change the way you see the world. And some days, it's hard. If you wake up late for work, it's going to be hard. If your kids come and get you out of bed, it's going to be real hard. Here's what I want you to do. I want the first thing you read in the morning to be the Word of God. And I want the last thing you read before you close your eyes at night to be the Word of God. try it if you fall asleep watching TV you got to change a habit I want you to switch I love ESPN I love watching it it's my favorite thing it's still got a slant because human beings are behind it it's still got a bent still got an opinion but the Word of God is the truth and if I can surround the noise with the truth of God then I can actually see the truth even in the midst of the noise. So here's my challenge for you. I'm going to challenge you to do something. I don't have my phone up here because Riley makes me take it out of my pocket before I come up on stage every Sunday. Here's the thing. I don't have my phone, but I'm going to challenge you to do something a little different. Don't read the Bible on your phone for this exercise. Now, if you follow a plan and stuff like that, do it. That's fine. But there's so much noise there. You're reading the Bible. Bling. Oh, so-and-so. Hey, what's up, bro? Like, there's so much noise there. I did this. I, I read the, just so you know, I'm not against phones. I, I follow Bible plans on my phone. It's my favorite Bible to read because I can go to any translation I want. And it's the smallest Bible I have. It's really awesome. But this is what I want to challenge you to do. An open Bible on your nightstand is really hard to walk past. Don't close it. Open it. And just start reading. And you don't have to read a chapter. If you read two verses and something jumps out, stop there. And that night, pick back up where you left off. And then read until something jumps out. And when it jumps out, stop there. Chew on it all day. Surround the noise with the truth and watch the truth be revealed in the midst of the noise. God wants you to set your eyes on truth and the truth won't be found while looking just at the noise. You have to remove yourself from it and set your eyes on truth. Let me pray for you. They're gonna sing a song for a second. We're gonna respond. I want us to repent today. Father, we repent. We ask for forgiveness and we turn around and change our ways, God. For when we have come toward you with our own questions, instead of saying, God, what should we be asking right now? When we've come at you and said, God, this is what I think, can you get with that? Instead of God, what should I think right now? When we've even come at you from a perspective of the noise and brought that to you to do something with God, when you're trying to remove us from the noise completely, God, we repent. We're sorry, Lord. And we ask that you would help us to set our eyes on your truth not the noise that is around us help us in this God help us in this Lord because your word is where hope is your word and your truth is where life is your word is where we find your presence your word is where we find deliverance your word is where we find the answer so let us get into your word Jesus Jesus' name.